Entry.audio, listen, like, and subscribe. If you are on YouTube, I'm told that you can hit that little bell, which is what will give you notifications to actually get notified when we release new content if you're enjoying this. Uh, today, I'm speaking with uh, influential heavy metal guitarist Terrence Hobbs from Suffocation. Now, unfortunately, whatever I did when I recorded this interview, we were doing it via Zoom, the camera has stayed on me for the duration of the interview, and there's no visuals of Terrence at all. So unfortunately, uh, it's an MP3 only interview, but I hope that you enjoy and that issue will be remedied for our next podcast. Thanks. Landry.audio, listen, like, and subscribe today. I am speaking with, this is a pleasure for me. I'm speaking with one of my favorite bands of, of all time with uh, Terrence Hobb, the, the founding guitarist of New York death metal legends, Suffocation. Uh, I am old enough. I am old enough to have purchased CDs back in that point in time. And I went into the, the closet oh, to actually man, find some of these there. things. And you I've got, there. trying trying to think of the ones I've, you know, Human Waste, which I think was the uh, the reissue on on Relapse, and then if I'm trying to go through, then we've got. Uh, I mean, originally it was on Relapse and Nuclear Blast when it first came out. When Nuclear Blast and Relapse were very new record labels, so that was like one of those pivotal little records, you know, or little EPs that in the very beginning for us, you know, we were trying to shop out for a label and we had ran into Relapse, but Relapse was very small only had one or two bands on them and nuclear blast over Europe only had one or two bands on them. So we actually linked them together. So we would be able to have some type of international distribution. So yeah. after, after all that uh, roadrunner episode and everything, and we went back to relapse, we ended up re repressing it again, you know, through that. This is a, a, a really cool place to start it if, if you're happy to do that. So, so for those of you, I guess if, if you're listening and you don't know who Terrence and Suffocation is, um, if you like, I guess, mainstream music, it's, it's probably not for you, but they carved out a very, a very, very unique sound in, um, you know, the, the late eighties, early nineties is when um, thrash started developing into something more aggressive, which is where you came yeah. up with, uh, with death metal. And, and they were around the scene sort of around the time when cannibal corpse was coming up in, in Buffalo and over in New York, actually, they created actually, yep. We used to play shows with them, you know, yes, they would yeah. drive from Buffalo down here and hang out with us and, jam and we'd go up there and play shows with them it was interesting back then <laughs> and, and Can cannibal corpse was a, was kind of based around you know brutality and gore which suffo yes. did but they started introducing a real you, you guys brought a level of technicality and sort of breakdowns and tempo changes that that were really unique to the very very different from a band like obituary which had yes. more sort of traditional you know chugga chugga yeah. type type music straightforward straight hell yeah. hammers across this yeah, it'd be as, as, as the as the people that came before you. So, you know, I'm trying to breed in the spawn I've got, as you said, Roadrunner. So that's a great place to, to talk about. And what I would argue, you know, everyone likes to, um, you know, well, I'm, I'm a little bit older. So as I said, so when I got into you guys, everyone was talking about Effigy of the Forgotten. But yeah. it was then, um, you know, the, the Milestone album, I guess the equivalent to Metallica's Black album, almost in the death metal scene, is, is Pierce from Within. <laughs> I only wish. I mean, it would be nice to sell 40 million copies of it. Yeah, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and what Trust I me, consider I still play uh, death metal, though, I wouldn't change. I wouldn't fucking crap out. Yeah, as I said, I was listening to a few other interviews. You know, like this is this where I'm maybe at. that's and, why and, I didn't sell 40 million records. But hey, what the fuck? You know? And and arguably, <laughs> in my opinion, even though it's only an EP, I would put this in like the top 10 to 15 records of all time. Which I'm, I'm glad you do like that. I mean, that was a. Uh, it is the, the and and one of the things that I I enjoy about you guys so much and and perhaps that's based around more uh more since sound studios and where we can get into that but um the production is uh, uh, well after we get beyond effigy and, and breeding the spawn once we get into Pierce and everything within the production is so crisp it it's got uh, it's got that sort of vinyl sound it's big it it resonates it it, it it's not that sort of digital or analog sound that translated over it. It sounds full and it's warm. Warm is probably the best way uh, I, I, I think. Describe. I think that, I mean, you know, all three of those albums were completely analog to tape albums. You know, they weren't, they weren't really digitized in any way. You know, maybe there was something like 
sliding around a kick drum to just make it land on time, you know, or something like that. But there was really, it, everything was literally just like recorded one after another. Like I would play two tracks, uh, you know, Cerrito or, um, you know, would play two tracks. We would have that all meshed together. And a lot of the reason that those productions sound great is simply because of Scott Burns. I mean, mm. there's, you know, Morris Sound Studios really, that was the, that was the pinnacle of the Florida death metal scene back in those days. And, you know, they have done everybody. They did not turn us obituary us, you know, um, Morbid Angel was in there, uh, just a, a atheist, a slew of fucking uh, cynic, you know, all these great bands. And for us to actually be kids and go down there and like, you know, learn something. Cause that's really what we were. We were kids. We didn't have any, any real serious music experience in recording studios and stuff. You guys were effectively starting to tour prior to even leaving high school back then. Is, is yeah. That I mean, we, right? that, well, we started to tour. I mean, we did have a tour early on, but we didn't tour enough. I don't think to really make the impact that we should have, I guess, you know, in hindsight, but, um, yeah, I mean, right out of school, once we had gotten signed and we had the opportunity to do some touring and do shows out of state and stuff like that. And that's when it like really started for us, you know, like starting to like really do touring because it started in little nitpick shows here and there, one from New York to New Jersey and then from New Jersey to like Pennsylvania and up to Connecticut and then out and further across the country. And then from there, the albums came out and when those albums came out that's when the offer for tour started yeah. and we did take some so right out of high school yeah i went on tour so if you're happy to with me when i get the chance to speak to you guys that i've listened to for years what i'm really interested in kind of telling the story historically of you know heavy metal and how you guys kind of fit into that picture because you know as you said it's sort of like uh you know, there's traditional heavy metal where we would have talked about like bands like Priest and Maiden, then punk rolls around the corner, which effectively introduces thrash. Then we start getting, um, you know, variants of this sort of music, where, as you said, we start getting Celtic Frost, Possessed, yeah. Bathory, it's these sorts of things. Heavier and heavier and heavier. Really. And then you guys come out of this, this next one and sort of, you know, you've already talked about Morbid Angel. I start thinking of, even though we would talk about them as a thrash band, I, I think Sepultura slots very comfortably oh, sort of in, in, into totally that sort right of, in the, right into that area. Creator, yes, exactly. Creator, Destruction, um, you know, obviously Merciful Fate, King Diamond, those bands, they fucking just, you know, smeared the world, you know what mm. I mean? They just, they took over. But, you know, there's Sodom, bands like that, they, yeah. those bands early, like, Early on, you're right. I mean, you nailed it right on the nose coming from like, let's say, like early rock and roll into where things became punk rock thrash, you know, hardcore, so on and so forth and started going more aggressive. You know what I mean? Yes. We were right there. So, you know, at that point in time, those were like, those were those bands, Celtic Frost, um, early obituary, like slowly we rot. When I first heard that, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> you know, um, we, were, we were crazy kids. We were crazy kids. And the local college station here, um, you know, because my family had worked at this college and I had gone to the college and worked there and stuff. We knew that some of the people at the radio station, and that's like how I got introduced to Sepultura. Yeah. You know, I mean, they were playing Slayer and Messiah and fucking Cryptic Slaughter and shit like that. But then, then, and King Diamond, you know, but then when that whole schizophrenia record hit, like for real, hit this college stations here, it fucking blew us to pieces, man. We yeah. were like, whoa, you know, wig blown back. I mean, as you can tell, and it, <laughs> it stayed that way, it stayed that way. <laughs> I've got that. I'm so glad you mentioned Cryptic Slaughter as well, because I, I, I bought those. So again, 20 years ago, if, if you're relapse, reissued those as well. And I bought those yeah. and there's no one else that I know that listens to that because um, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting place where I'd like to take the conversation with you because I said a lot of people that I know who listen to heavy metal, first of all, in the group and the people that I know, and I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like, you know, they, they knew Metallica. They might know a little bit about Megadeth. They may or may not have listened to Anthrax. They, they stayed very, very mainstream. Then yeah. the people that were into like punk music weren't into hardcore. So the people I know that listen to Sex Pistols were not listening yeah. to DRI or Cryptic Slaughter yeah. and these sorts of bands. And so 
first of all, I think Cryptic Slaughter is, is fantastic because I think they're kind of like the I mean, they, Napalm Death. They, and, and really, they really were like one of the precursor like grind bands, if mm. you know what I mean. You know, it's the same thing. With, well, that's like, where well, Suffolk comes. That 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 yeah. literally snare, and that I mean, that was that, the first time I've seen that thing. integrated into music, like as 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 a fundamental part of your sound, effectively. Yeah, I mean, we we really just when we heard something new and listened to it, or like, I mean, even 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 back in the day, like Mike Smith, you know, who invented like the glass beat or whatever. Yeah. Even him, you know, when I was jamming with him. It, he would turn around and be like, you know, listen to that and listen to like Where Mock to Cryptic Slaughter. And, you know, of course we liked Anthrax and SMD, all those old nuclear assault, you name it, you know, all that stuff. And for him to start doing that bah, 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 beat, to me really did remind me of like, like Cryptic Slaughter or something. And I find that they're like those progenitors to, to the things that we ended up doing, you know yes. what I mean? Which is really really cool. I'm glad that you recognize those bands too. Like, and well, the, and that's uh, well because it, like when, when I got into how I got into Relapse. So in in my late teens, if you remember back then, Relapse used to issue um, the sampler records. So they'd put like you yes. know Brutal Truth and all these bands on yeah. on a on a mix CD, and you can go and buy that for about eight dollars. And that was my my introduction into like this world of of you know what we would Different know I guess music, is extreme yeah. music now. Yeah. So where I'm going with this, Terrence, is 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 back in the '80s and. And again, so I, I got into metal in the, in the mid nineties. Like a lot of people, it's like Guns N' Roses was my, you, we talk about gateway bands, you know, it's right, sort of like, right, you, right, right. exactly. You go Gunners, you go like, Metallica, then off you right. go, you know? Yep. That, and was, so, that was like Iron Maiden and stuff for me. Iron mm. Maiden and uh, Judas Priest and things like that. Those, those bands are obviously just heinous gateway bands to things to, to come, you know? So in, amazing. In, in the 80s then, and, and where I'm going with this conversation is from my understanding when we go sort of, what, what is that, 30, 34 years in the past now, Yeah. at the time it was just kind of considered heavy metal. So do you remember when the genres began to sort of split off into this family tree? Because it was sort of like Maiden, Sabbath, Priest, Deep Purple, and all of a sudden Metallica comes out. And that sort of seems to be like a first point with Kill 'Em All of where it, we start getting this divergent path almost. Yeah, I, I, man, I, I think that, you know, when it came down to like, let's say, cause we all knew about heavy metal and rock and roll, you know, at that point in time, you know, Ozzy Osbourne, Diary of a Madman, Blizzard of Oz, um, you know, Dio, Last in Line, um, you know, early Maiden records, Killers, things like that, which even though that like, you know, Killers and those early Maiden records were almost punk rockish, you know, they still were kind of considered heavy metal. And I think for me, I mean, to coin the term thrash metal, I think Metallica kind of coined it. Mm. Like, because when I heard, you know, when I heard Ride the Lightning, which is the first record I had heard from Metallica, so I was late, you know, I didn't have Kill Em All before that. I listened to it after I had heard Ride the Lightning. And I was like, I guess, I don't know, what, 16, maybe 15 or 16. And um, we were like, man, this thing, will, you know, kind of wreck your neck, thrash metal. And I was like, thrash metal, we need to hear more of that. And like, we'd have like public UHF stations on the TV. So we had this one here called U68. And U68 was like the power hour. And I'm not sure if it was Canadian or not here in New York. I'm not sure if it was, but they they had Thor, they had Lee Aaron, they had Doro. Thor. <laughs> yeah, they had, that's uh, not a name I hear very they often. They had these Razor, days. they had Razor, and a bunch of other bands. And like when Razor and when Razor, like I seen that video for Evil Invaders, and I can't remember even. I was a fucking kid, you know. Yeah. I was like, this is just the greatest thing I've ever heard, and it just literally opened up my whole mind to like so many other different bands. So at that point. You know, every weekend we were at the mall going to all the record shops looking for things that had crazy different album covers on it. You know, if it had an explicit warning on it, that was the first thing we were buying. <laughs> you know, we couldn't look at the cover and it was gory and shit, stuff like that. It would have had to have been Canadian then because both Thor and Razor are in... in, in yeah, and I, I mean, back yeah. then that was like thrash metal. And obviously, as I, I was telling you, you know, we had our local radio station here. And uh, when we went up there, there was we were exposed to less like whatever that radio station had sent to them, you know, 
through the mail. So it, it kind of opened up a lot of things like bands like Hyrax and uh, uh, Messiah and, um, you know, the Cryptic Slaughters, the, the Wehrmachts, yeah. Autopsy, you know, because being that young and at the time we weren't really playing out of state, everything was like, you know, a mailing list at your show. Like you'd sign up for it, you'd get a flyer or maybe you'd go over to the merch booth and buy a CD. And everything from that point was tape trading. Mm. So, you know, that was how I was exposed to more slowly, but surely more, more music, more, and more thrash metal. Now we just get all that through the internet. You know, we yeah. don't get the physical copies and you're not having to take a self focus set or a CD you burned and put it in the mail and send it to somebody. It's very you know, interesting so, when you talk about that. We're, we're yeah. old enough in an age to, to have seen the internet because, you know, you're touching on I, I remember when I would listen to the radio and they'd say, we have a new track from X artist coming up and I had to hit record on my cassette. Record to on try your cassette it. and record the whole show. Like, uh, yeah. And that way you could go back in order to listen to it. And it was kind of fucked up because now we just take that shit for granted. You know, you skip to the song you want. You, you, you pop this one in. You got an iPod that holds a billion songs on it, you know. You have, you know, Sirius and all the rest of those digital radio stations. So it's it's a lot different now, you know. It's 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 a lot different. But Do I wouldn't change people, um, value music anymore. And what I mean by that is because it's so instantaneous. So as I said, like, you know, we, we used to go out, we used to, you know, buy buy the CD. And we know that heavy metal fans generally will are still an audience that oh, will yeah. go buy that. Mm-hmm. But I mean, but I mean, like you you drop a record and you listen to the whole thing. You know, we know the difference. Some bands are sort of based on singles. Others are based on, you know, the experience of, of an entire album. Um, do, do you think sort of, you know, music is, is valued the way that it would have been prior to well, the onset I, of the I, internet? I think, I, I don't, well, I think for artists, uh, older artists that had to go through that whole thing, I think they have a little bit more respect. I think they have a more mature outlook on it because now anybody can find anything anytime they want it, you know? And with that being said, it doesn't, it doesn't hold like true to saying like somebody who worked their ass off and gave you a CD and that was the only way you could get it. You know what I mean? Mm. You kind of valued that CD when you got it and you listened to it and you're like, whoa, that song was cool. That song was cool. This band kicks ass. Like now you have that CD and you would put it in a rotation in your, in, in your player or you'd use the cassette like and put it in your cassette deck. Nowadays, people just put it on for three seconds and they can turn it off. They, they have access to it so fast. So I don't think that they actually respect the amount of work that's gone into producing the music but they just take it more for granted because it's just so readily available yeah you know i i think i think it is that way to some degree i'm not going to say that's with everybody because there's a lot of people that grew up and that raised their kids that way to, to have like to respect the things that they have and the, the work that's put into it and you know take pride in that kind of thing for me it's like i would prefer to actually you know, if somebody sends me a song on Facebook, for example, you know, listen to my song, I just put it out, blah, blah, blah. I may not immediately be able to fucking listen to it. I go back to listen to it. And if I like it, I'll at least respond and be like, yo, this is pretty cool. Maybe I'll take it and I'll post it on Facebook for other people to hear it because it's out and they're just getting exposure that way or something. And hopefully a lot more bands and people do things like that because that's that's like more like the new day and age sort of thing where you're promoting your friend's band and you're keeping the scene alive that way. And hopefully people will respect that in the long run, you know, but it's, mm. it's too easy now. People can go, Oh, I want to hear this. Bip. They put it on. Oh, I can rip it. Bip. Oh, the CD has gone. Bip. They don't, they don't have to go and buy it. It's already given out to them. So it sucked the bottom out of the music industry, which made Lars Ulrich right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it did. It fucking made him right. There's probably a lot of a lot of people listening to this as well that we wouldn't even remember that because what Napster was 2000. So yeah, again, we're, we're talking about people that you know you'd have to be 25 to 30 to even remember that now. Exactly. Yeah. You know, 21 year olds don't even know that anymore. They yeah. can't remember a rotary phone. You know what I mean? <laughs> or when you had to stop on the side of the road, put a quarter in it, and actually remember the phone number that you needed to type in to call somebody. You know, that's all taken for granted now, which is it's a different style. It's sad for me because you know. Being the age I am, which is fucking old as dirt, you know, now, um, you know, you kind of had to know those simple traits and skills in order to get by and things, you mm-hmm. know. Now people don't have to do that anymore. It's all, it's all automatic. And, 
And I always like to, to ask artists because of the onset and this transformation, as I said, like even, even for myself, you know, I used to go out and buy physical copies and that's not necessary anymore. You, you might buy a digital download of it. How does that change what you guys do? Because, you know, you used to, I, I know that the, the percentage of the value of the sale wasn't very high, but a lot of bands, you know, made their living off selling physical copies. And oh. these days it seems that pretty much the album is just, the teaser of the trailer to try to get you to go out and see the show and then to sell merch. So how, how does that work for you guys now in terms of how you make your living? I think you nailed it on the nose right there. I mean, really that's what we have to do. I mean, granted, there's always an X amount of physical copies and I mean, you gotta, you gotta understand like the metal industry itself, like the, the underground scene, you know, whether or not it's punk rock or if it's or hardcore or death metal, black metal, literally is what saved the vinyl industry you yes know, yeah. to the point where the vinyl industry is now saturated you know to the mm. point where they can't get the vinyl out fast enough there's the factories aren't there anymore there's only a few of them and it's the bands that go out and they play live that produce that vinyl for us old schoolers that prefer to have vinyl even though you know for us to even have a, re- a regular record player anymore is kind of like you know, old hat, you're lucky if you have an old techniques with the diamond needle and, you know, and you put on your wax, you usually use real wax. That's kind of gone. Most of the people that are buying those vinyls are taking them and getting them signed and hanging them on their wall. They want to have it as a collector piece Mm. more than they're using it to listen to music. And the people that really want to just have a CD, a physical copy, they go to the shows and buy them. So yeah, we're not like, you know, we have to go out and we have to be playing live in order to keep our, our album sales consistent. You know, it's not like it was back in the day where a band could do one tour and their record sales are up through the roof and everybody is going out buying the records. Yeah. They don't have to anymore. Now they want to go to the show in order to buy it. And that's really what they have to do. If not, everything's digital. And if they didn't buy it digitally, they just downloaded it like Napster, mm. you know? Which I, I would have to say, if you're in a country and, and you don't have money and you can't buy it and you know suffocation and you like a record, fuck it, download it. You know what I mean? I would rather you listen to the music and maybe that one day you could get to a concert or go to a show or buy our next record because you you know you, you like the band, even though you just had to. You know, it's kind of like that point where you have to take the cassette and hit the record button from the other cassette. You know, yeah, yeah. and record it in order to get it from your friend. You know, well, it's it's, it's funny that you mention that because I, I'm originally from Canada. I'm, I've, I moved out here in around 2004, and so now that I live in Australia, which is just an island, I remember going to watch gigs in Canada, and it was oh, yeah. you know we're, we're talking about 20 25 years ago now. But are you talking about the, at food funds? I'm it, sorry. Where, where were you? Where, where were you? Uh, I'm, I'm from a city called Calgary, which is a which oh, was a Calgary. pretty a pretty conservative uh, city yeah. around. So like. Back cold. then, what we cold a little bit concerned. We didn't get a lot of you guys come down, but we, we used to get like guys like Cryptopsy a lot because they just yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. travel through Canada. But um, you know, back then it was twenty or twenty five bucks to go see a band. And I remember when I moved to Australia, gigs were eighty bucks minimum a pop. All of a sudden, yeah, that sounds crazy they, to me. Right they had now. they had to get the band down there. So all of a sudden, you know what what we used to be able to the ticket price for what we would get for a festival in North America is what we were paying mm. to get a single headliner and also down here we generally don't get the openers as well so you're paying like you know 80 bucks just yeah. for the headlight with maybe some local bands because we're so far removed from everyone else we, as you know we get the end of the tour so you get we get Australia one city which is Auckland New Zealand and then typically yeah. Tokyo so we're either the beginning or the end of the tour generally right well i mean for us when we come down there we try to hit each city you know we try to do sydney melbourne adelaide perth um uh what else what's the other one we got Perth. Most most places skip Perth because it's on 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 the west yeah, side. So yeah, yeah, but and Brisbane. So and we got Brisbane as well. Brisbane. That was the one I was thinking of. I couldn't fucking. Get it. <laughs> That's, uh, all right. But we try to we try to hit as much as we can because you know we're an underground band and the only way to really, I mean, even after thirty fucking years, right? Yeah. The only way to really get your your name out and to show face and to keep everybody happy is to try to get to every place you can yeah so what what has that meant for you guys then so i I said what before we hit record we were talking about new york and and covid so i mean i assume most of you guys have had to go find jobs and find other other sort of work what what is the sort of last year and a half two years done to you guys 
Well, I mean, it's been difficult for us only because, I mean, if everybody was in New York and now that we're older, people have moved away. We have a drummer who's from Canada, yeah. you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, for him to get across the board, it was a little bit more difficult. So it made it slower on writing our, our next record, so to speak. And we're about halfway there through that. But to make a long story short, we had to try to keep our sanity. So what we would do is we would just sit around and write. I would take on some side projects, some mixing projects, um, you know, guitar solos, things, things like that, work on some friends stuff, um, guitar lessons, things like that, just to keep busy and to keep some money coming in and things like that. You know mm. what I mean? Um, from that point, I just spent a lot of time trying to do the rehearsal room down here and get this all squared away so we could do some recording and pre-productions and things. Make it easier for us writing, you know, make it a little tighter and nicer for us. You know, so doing, my, doing your best to keep busy effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Fine, exactly. fine, yeah. Okay. Um, um, just uh, everything across the board, you know, yeah. is, is really what we're trying to do. Just keep it, just keep it sane. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to shoot myself. If I don't ask these questions again. I think what we've got, we've got an hour of time. So, so I don't want to, I don't want to not ask these questions while, while I got, okay. while I got you here. So, um, so, I guess we'll talk about uh, Morrison Sound Studios as well, because I guess for, for people like me who listen to this music, I guess, you know, well, what are we thinking? There's probably, it, in my mind, there's sort of four big kind of studios. Like I, I, I spoke to uh, Peter Tatgren the, the other week from Hypocrisy, yeah. so we're talking yeah. about Abyss. Awesome. Yeah, so we've, we've got uh, Morrison Sound Studios. Yep. Um, what's, what's Eric's studio? Eric Rutan's studio? Oh, uh, Mana? Um, yeah, Mana. Mana. Studio and uh like devon townsend so I, I remember like when the original lamb of god cd dropped i think that was recorded with devon so those in in my head those are sort of i guess what i would consider the four big studios that have produced the general output of the music that i listen to how did you guys get introduced to morrison sound studio and 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 what did that do for you because again uh, if i try to relate this to to more mainstream music it feels like to me Morrison did for suffocation almost like what Bob Rock did when he did the Black Album with Metallica. Like it just seemed to well, yeah, boost everything. I, you know, I mean, for us, getting introduced to Morrison Sound was done through Roadrunner. Yeah. Roadrunner just they they knew Jim and they knew Scott, and I mean, you have to figure like Obituary, um, you know, Morbid Angel, Cynic, Deicide, um, Nocturnus. Everybody was recording that yeah, back then. Right? A lot yeah. of bands were recording down there, and that was making, you know, that was making that Florida, Florida niche back in the 90s to, to be the hotbed of all the fucking thrash and death and shit metal mm. coming out. And when we got signed to Roadrunner, we decided they really decided you should go here and work with this guy. And for us, we didn't know any better, you know. We weren't, we didn't know how to record ourselves, we didn't know you know, what are good techniques to use in recording. We didn't have the facility or know of the facilities to go to. So it was really eye-opening because when we went down there and actually went to Morris Sound to see like the gold records on the wall from Warrant and like other bands, you know. Were they Grand recording Band. guys like that? Were they? Warrant yeah, and they stuff were. like they, that. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. you know. and I had uh, no idea. Yeah, to see those, to see those, um, records on the wall and, and shit like that. I was like, damn, I was like, this is a serious studio. And then, um, you know, they had like, they had the A room and the B room and in the A room, Morbid Angel was just getting done with Jim Morrison. So okay. like we went in there to go and smoke some weed and everything, you know, just cause we were able to hang out and clean yeah. our weed and went up and go smoke it. And then we go in the B room and in the B room was where we did all of our tracking with Scott. And I mean, Scott is just, he's just a fucking awesome engineer. Like he just knows, I mean, from experience, you know, what to do and how to do it. And for us, we didn't really know Dick. So we thought, you know, cause we were well rehearsed with our songs, at least so we thought until, you know, we went in there and like, he was like, all right, you gotta play this. And then he went through taking out all the noise. And then he went through making us play it again. And then he went through trying this out and then he went through the cabinets and how the drums were set out and like just you know he was just super knowledgeable and it it kind of really rubbed off a lot on me you know and mm -hmm. i think on the other guys too because the process of recording we really didn't know that well and he gave us that 
process on how you should do it properly, you know? And that was, you know, when I'm 21 years old, now it's 30 something years later. And still to this day, I follow those types of things in my own recordings and everything else, you know? Mm. So it, it was really a very eye-opening experience. It was a humbling experience. Um, it, it was bad and good all at the same time because for all the, being the little ego strong kid who didn't really know anything, you know, and, and having to fucking really put in that amount of time and effort into making a recording yeah. and learning how hard it really was to do that was, was something else. Man. It really it was, it was something else. And what do you think about where, um, I guess I'll, I'll ask sort of where the scene is now. And, and what do I mean by that? So death sure. metal is, is something that you and I are more kin and grew up in that scene and things have changed and moved on. And it's sort of like in, in the early 2000s, we had new metal and then that kind of evolved into metal core. And then yep. probably for about maybe the last 10 years or so, there's been this um, crossover between traditional death metal and metal core which has given us death core, death core and, I, yeah. and i would say the difference between death core is that it, it is still extreme it's, it's very very heavy with a lot of breakdowns yeah. but yeah. you also get those sort of moody high notes that sit within all of the music and and what i'm getting at is that for people that are a little bit older like you and me there still seems to be a lot of people despise anything from new metal and that's come out that that are a little bit yeah. older but death core and like i i love bands like thy art is murder which is from sydney Carter here. X, yeah Carter, know. yeah defend death metal and all this sort of stuff but oh. there's uh so many people are are kind of are, are repulsed by this but this this seems to be the natural evolution of of death metal what do you yeah. sort of think of that scene and and and, and i guess you know, how, how that has evolved into what it is now well, I mean, it, as far as that goes, I mean, I think deathcore and metalcore and like the newer styles of metal, they are kind of a natural progression. I think that it's also that people are trying to incorporate things that are a little bit more commercially viable. Yeah. Once Korn came out with seven and eight string guitars, then everything went to that super low tonal, tonal thing, you know, um, not traditional six string guitars, you know, like this, where it's, uh, you know, where it's more just rooted on the heavier notes of things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I could understand why some people despise it because it is rudiment, it, rudiment, you know, a lot of it is very rudimentary. So, not, so, so right. simple, almost like new metal, simplistic, like bomb, yeah, bomb, very bomb, 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 And I think that people understand that there's a lot more to guitars than adding strings and there's a lot more to music than just following that kind of that kind of rudimentary thing you know even in blues it's a little bit more complicated and tasteful yeah. and i'm not yeah. i'm not trying to bust on all those bands because they, you know they're all just trying to do the same shit we're doing they're just doing it a different way you know mm -hmm. what i mean and plus it's younger kids so younger kids are exposed to this like more in school and stuff like that. So I think that they gravitate towards the newer stuff more than the old stuff because they just never were really yeah, of course. exposed to it, yeah. you know? And uh, I mean, when they do cut across really heavy, like bands like Whitechapel, um, you know, like Suicide Silence, Carnifex, uh, Thy Artist Murder, you know, great bands, Ingested, shit like that. Um, I don't even know if it just fits in that category as well, but there's still that vibe of music is still bringing forth like a lot of the really angst, aggression, the the distorted tonal workings of things in in music. So I don't think it's all that bad. I don't frown on it all that much. Is it my taste? No, I'd rather go and listen to Immortal. You know what I mean? Yeah, or, yeah. Or, you know, something like that. Aeon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Aeon, you know, decapitated, something like that. So that's did you... My did, did you enjoy the? Uh, I'll ask kind of kind of two questions from here. So so if we talk about early two thousand, you know, when we talk about bands like Corn and Slipknot, again, these are the sort of mainstream bands, but that's kind of, kind of the last period that I remember where heavy metal was really really big. Did did you guys experience the trickle down effect? Did did Suffo's popularity grow? Yeah, I mean, through, I mean, through this period it, as well. We've seen it go like this all throughout the course yeah. of our career. I mean, in the beginning, in the beginning, even though that was like a founding record, like Effigy it still wasn't like received the way that like, let's say um, 
Autism Madness was, you know, yeah. and that, that has a lot to do with us just being naive and not really doing the touring we were offered and eating shit the way that we should have back then, you know, that came later for us, actually. Okay. But it, as far as like crowd attendance, people paying attention, um, people wanting to go to shows, you know, it always varied. So bands like Slipknot that really cut through, you know what I mean? They cut through with the, the costume gimmick. It's still having the grinding stuff with Joey. It's still being like the down picky stuff. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the vocal aspect cut across more with the new core, new metal core mm. styles of stuff, even though it was still heavy, it still had some heavy shit, but it cut across. I think they had a very good blend to what was coming after. You know what I mean? Because yeah. bands kind of really try to imitate that style a lot from there. Like, Baby metal to me. I love baby than, metal. Love it. I know okay. they're, they're awesome. Love it. They're awesome. I think the, the musicians are fantastic. The bands are I, I'm all in. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Right. But I mean, you know, just that style of music, just the music itself, the style. Like Slipknot made that style. And I think a lot of bands, like After the Burial and things like that, that started doing more of the Dejunty. Uh, I can't even really call them Dejunty. They're definitely fucking definitely some serious heavy metal well you know when, when you but, talk about it, it, it opened it up and gave people more room to kind of experiment and i think in that area of experimentation a lot of people like kind of frowned on it mm. you know? but and, yeah, and it sucks so. to be close-minded in my opinion well i mean, I mean if, if we're thinking in that line it's sort of like as, as you said going back it's like cryptic slaughter then napalm as more as as grind that then suffo brought in that blast beat and then when i sort of start thinking you know the first little album's a little bit more rappy but i was heavy it's it's not too far off potentially from what's up and but you know joe you talk about joey and i'm like i remember there, there's a lot of elements of blast that blast, that happened yeah. in those those early albums so it's not too far off from you guys right exactly and i mean i you know they were into the death metal stuff as well in their earlier career so you know, I guess most of those dudes know of us as well as we know them. Mm. But just to make a long story short, like they took like the styles of music that, you know, from the hardcore riffy stuff to the grinding blast beat stuff to a little bit more of the melodic catchy two step stuff, you know, that you'd hear in like some hardcore music and stuff like that. They really kind of etched that. And a lot of bands really went and followed it, which I think opened up that area to the deathcore stuff, as well as some metalcore stuff that's like newer nowadays, you know? Yeah, cool. For me, they, that was like, they were pretty much a one of a kind band because I had never heard of anything like them mm. before, them, you know? Oh, well, Corn, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's you know, they, they took the seven string guitar thing to the next level, you know? So I, I, I want to take you back to to what when we opened up the conversation historically, um, as I said, I've got effigy. It's on Road Runner, I think, which used to be yep. Road Racer before then. Then you talk about how you the release um, came out dually through through Nuclear Blast and Relapse at the same time. Tell me, sort of, you know, Road Racer ended up becoming Road Runner. I remember like those early yeah. SEP albums all, all came out on there. What was the status of, of that label and, and sort of, uh, I guess, the well, the scene I and mean, these sorts of labels back then? Well, I mean, the record label itself was always really a great label. There was, you know, Roadrunner was like, let's say, the number one label. Like, you'd have Roadrunner, Earache, Metal Blade. Yeah. Uh, you know, those three labels were like the quintessential ones, you know, with as far as Roadrunner is concerned, at that time for us, they had like a slew of like thrash bands and heavy bands at the time. And I think as a record label, as time went on for them, that's when they started dropping bands. Like, I guess they just, I guess the owner of Roadrunner just wanted to sell it and be done with it, you know? Okay. And from that point, all the really heavy bands slowly were just either fulfilling their con uh, contracts and be done with the label or getting dropped, which is what happened to us. And I found out that from Glenn Benton from Deicide on tour. Yeah, right. Okay. Which was kind of odd because he was, he, you know, he had went and had a meeting with the owner of Roadrunner at that point in time in the Netherlands. So he, you know, Roadrunner was originally uh, a Dutch label and it became this big, huge thing for all the underground and thrash bands of our time and era, you know, the mm. 1991, 1993, 1996. 
But from there, they went to go and sell it. So, I mean, as a record label, they always treated us really well, but it wasn't like, it wasn't somebody like Nuclear Blast and Relapse who like, where we ended up going back to them after Roadrunner. Yeah. They had all grown in, in size themselves and had things worked out with distribution. And they still support the, you know, the bands of, like They're now, invested in your. They, they yeah, need and, as and, much and, as and you I mean, in a, in a I think that time. Nuclear Blast now is the roadrunner of yesteryear, mm. except for they're doing it right. You know what I mean? They're sticking it out and throughout how like technology is changing and you know computers are making it easier and more access and streaming radio and yada yada, all that stuff. Like Roadrunner is, I mean, Nuclear Blast has kind of embraced it, you know, and made it work for them which is you know now they have hate breed they had slayer they had us they have you know tons and tons and tons of bands that we all would like to you know go to their concerts and share the stage with and buy their records you know so for me nuclear blast is is, is fantastic but with roadrunner with roadrunner it was kind of tough because you know getting on the label made us all excited even though that we were kids and we didn't know what we we're doing but as time went on it just like it deteriorated. They didn't support the bands. Mm. So they, they were almost yeah. exiting heavy metal by the time. That yeah, you were the label. exactly. So right. yeah. you know, they, they didn't know how to market a bunch of, of people like us. We weren't like your average long hair dudes. We were, you know, with costumes and gimmicks and, and things like that. You know, you had a strange black guy like me and you had Mike Smith, another black dude. You know, we we're all young and crazy. Our singer was 90 pounds. Something like that. So I don't think that Roadrunner really knew how to approach us. Uh, how to approach us and sell us as a band around the world, even though we got our start there and it was a good start for us. You know mm. what I mean? I just don't think that they, they fully knew. But well, that's, a, that's the next area that, that I wanted to go into. And I, you know, it's, I, I'm really bothered by how these days, I'm sure you know what I mean. It's like, everything is politicized. It's like, you know, yes. the, the, everything is political, but one of the things is said that, that I found very, very unique when I got into suffocation, I, I'm trying to think of, think historically there's not really a lot of black guys in heavy metal like i can think of sort of no. you know bad brains living color god Bushy forbid Echo. was another band that i was really into yeah. but yeah. like between you and mike when suffo came and i was like black guys in heavy metal how how did you guys get into it and, and also i guess the, the next extension of that is you know you listen to it but why aren't there more black guys who just it's it's all rap why doesn't I, anyone I, like heavy metal I, I don't know i you know I think that there's, I think that they're out there. Don't think that they're not. I just don't, I just think that a lot of them haven't had a time or chance or a band that people have taken notice to, to, to say, hey, there's a black guy in the band. You know, like you look at Old Entombed, they had a black guy in the band. You look at High yeah. Racks. They, Alex, you know, yeah, even Howard though, from you know, Killswitch, yeah. Yeah, yeah Howard cool. from Killswitch. Um, you know, you look at Cyclone Temple, another band from Chicago, they had a black guy. Oceano has a black guy. Um, Lang Chi has a black guy. So there's there's bands out there that have black guys in Jesus Peace, another band from Philadelphia out here, black guy in the band. Volvadinha from South Africa, black guy in the band. So there there's there there are the, there are the brothers are out there, man. And they're, you know, <laughs> and they're making heavy shit. Don't no, think they're not. They may not be playing hockey that much, but they're still out there. And you know, I think for us, the time and place, it was just an oddball thing that you know. We just, like me, I happened to just pick up a guitar when I was like, you know, 10 or 11 years old. And by 13, everything I wanted to do was just play a guitar. So I locked myself in a room and was just listening to things that had guitar. It wasn't like dance music, you know what I mean? Yep. And it was heavy. And then when we were in high school and, you know, me and Frank and Mike Smith and Doug Cerrito, and we would play the Battle of the Bands and like, you know, we all wanted to play heavy music. It was just, for us, it was just, that's what we wanted to do. It didn't matter about color or anything, you know? Mm. It, and I mean, for Roadrunner, you know, back at the time, Nuclear Blast, Relapse, I mean, I was happy that they didn't really, that they paid attention to us, even though it was that way, because we never knew if it was going to be like, are we going to get signed? Are they going to look at us like we're fucking shot, you know? Yeah, you got yeah. the one fat guy in the band or the one black guy in the band or something, you know, you just never knew how anybody was going to take it. Mm. And I, we were very fortunate to not really have any of those problems other than them just wanting to drop us just because they were dropping every yeah, yeah. band. 
I uh, I wish we had more time with you. There's a lot of a lot of want to ask. I think we, we could probably. Hey man, you know I am hour, work, but... I am working on a new album. So <laughs> yeah, which can, which we apparently can, is what we're here we to can, talk about. What we're here to yeah, well, you got yeah, something coming well, out. I'm not talking about the live one that's coming uh-huh. out. Okay. November 12th. I'm talking about the one that's supposed to come out in the middle of next year. Right. So we still we still got some work to do. But we'll get her done. So maybe we'll we can that. talk to you again sometime soon. I, I would be honored. Uh, the last thing I'll ask you about, I remember a few years ago, and this blew my mind when it happened, because because we talked about how this is sort of ex- extreme underground music. Um, mm-hmm. I think someone sent me a clip. I can't remember where I found out about it. There was an advert for the History Channel. And all yes. of a sudden, Suffo's in this warehouse or something just yep. grinding out. And I can't even remember what they were promoting. But okay. I, it blew my mind. All of a sudden, Suffocation is doing an advert for the History Channel. I just went, what is, what is going on? Okay, basically what happened was, you know, we're here in New York hanging out. And, you know, our management, EMG, really cool. Um, turned out that A&E Channel, History Channel, you know, they were all part of each other, Discovery Channel, were doing a thing called the Dark Ages. And it was all about medieval... That's right. Medieval yeah. knights and warriors and things like that. So we, they were looking around for a band that could fill the void of being like a really heavy band and doing a clip for a commercial. So we vied for it. And literally, it, 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 we, we found out about it like three days before we went to go and film it. And it turned out that they filmed it in Brooklyn. So it was just like, our drive for us, to, we packed up a van and drove out there and did a video with A and D, and it's still a commercial to this day. It, you know, they said they were soliciting a band, and we just happened to get it. Yeah, right. Cool. It was a weird thing. So the Dark Ages, and it's um, it's uh, Blood Oath, I think, is the song. Yes. Cool. I well, got- remember I've done so much music. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so you guys have a live album uh, coming out. Well, yes. um, if, if you're doing promo and press again next year for, for whatever you're doing on side, I'd love to speak with you again. For anyone who is checking this out, who, who doesn't listen to stuff, as I said, my favorite one is Despise the Sun. Five Despise tracks. I think, I think it's only about 20, 22 minutes long. It, it is yeah. short, but if you, if you and it's crisp, it's again, it sounds full. It's got a warm sound. That's the production on on heavy music is sometimes really Scott really Burns hard to get too. yeah it's and it's too. and and it is awesome so but if, if you're if you're listening Thanks. to me and some of the other guests and you want to know what i'm listening to i listen to guys like suffocation and that they are it's this has been really cool i really appreciate your time and i uh, hopefully Thanks, lots of questions i'd love to do it again with you sometime next yeah time. absolutely man just you know keep the eyes and ears open man we'll do this again man no problem awesome well, all the best with your press and hopefully things will open up and we might even get to see you in person again at some point. Fucking trying, Jesse. Let me get <laughs> over there. Fuck this bug virus bullshit. <laughs> All right. It'll be All great the to best. get out to you guys, man. Awesome. Same Thanks to so much you. for your time, Terrence. Stay safe. Stay without COVID. We'll see you out there and stay heavy. All right. Cheers. Peace, brother. <laughs>